Hey everyone, and welcome to our DAT IQ weekly market update. This is our update for September 2nd, 2020. I'm Ken Animo, Chief of Analytics at DAT, joined as always by the astute Ned Damon, who's our Principal Data Scientist, and Dean Croak, who's our Principal Industry Analyst at DAT. Hey guys. Howdy. Hey, hey Ken. So as typical, we are going to run through some of the interesting stuff happening in the market this week. I'll lead us off with some key points. Dean will take lead on market updates. There's some really interesting stuff going on in the market. And Ned will talk about forecast models. I also want to talk about we will be going live tomorrow, uh, Thursday, September 3rd at 3 o'clock on LinkedIn. And um, I think other channels will be links in the descriptions below. But um, we'd love to have some questions come in from our viewers. It'll be our first experience. So um, apologies ahead of time if it's a little rocky. but. Really looking to, forward to it um, and getting to answer some questions about what's going on in the market live. So I'll quit talking in a minute after I wrap up key points because like I said, Dean has some exciting stuff to talk about. Um, so key points for the week. Spot rates continue to defy seasonal trends and pretty much all logic and continue to climb. So we had Hurricane Laura last week and you know the impact there was very centralized. We, we put some stuff out on, on social and through the market update about the New Orleans markets and Houston, but kind of nationwide, we're, we're continuing to see rates, especially for dry vans climb. Uh, on the contract side, uh, from our partners at FMIC, we're seeing spot market volume is jumping, but the contract volume may be not so much. And as a result, we're seeing share of spot market increase um, up to 21%, right? Normally that's in the 12 to 15% range. We're seeing carriers, we've talked about this quite a bit, continuing to honor contract commits, but just not the surge volume. And then lastly, on the capacity front, ATA reporting 3% fewer trucks operating this summer, um, which is, again is fueling the fires of the spot market. So with that, I will turn it over to Dean to walk us through the details. Dean? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, I'm going to start off the supply demand update this week with the dry van uh, load board activity. Um, last week, we saw the load to truck ratio jump by about 11% to 5.73. It was fueled largely by an 11% increase in, in load posts on the spot market. Um, it's interesting that that volume is now about double the volume of 2019, which is a reflection of the market imbalance that we've been talking about in recent weeks, plus Hurricane's Laura, Hurricane Laura's impact uh, last week. Capacity loosened slightly. There were about 1% more trucks searching on load boards for dry van loads last week. On the reefer side, uh, the load to truck ratio spiked last week up 20% to about 10.73. It's tracking really closely to 2017 levels now. Uh, it was driven largely last week by a 16% increase in load posts. Again, like dry van, it's about double the volume this time last year. Capacity um, tightened slightly, about 3% fewer trucks were, were um, uh, looking for loads last week. On the uh, flatbed load board activity side, uh, there was an increase this week against trend, but it's fairly normal for active hurricane seasons. So it's tracking closely to 2017. There was a lot of building material activity being moved into uh, the, the Gulf Coast and Florida markets in 2017 when Irma and Harvey hit. Load posts in the flatbed market last week increased by about 5%. Capacity tightened. There were about 6% fewer trucks searching for loads on load boards last week. So moving over to our market condition index for dry vans, uh, focusing on the West Coast this week, as Ken mentioned earlier, there's a lot of activity there. Uh, after volumes being relatively flat for the last couple of weeks out of Los Angeles and Ontario, volumes are starting to trend upwards again, which is interesting. Uh, volumes are up about 6% week over week after being flat. Rates continue to climb, though. They're up 2% week over week to $2.97 a mile, which is the fourth week for successive increases out of those large West Coast markets. Uh, on the Gulf Coast markets, Hurricane Laura uh, resulted in New Orleans and Houston markets inbound volume spiking 20% week over week as emergency agencies staffed uh, stage relief supplies. Uh, in contrast, though, outbound volumes dropped about 10% week over week, which is fairly normal for a midweek hurricane event. On the refrigerated market condition index side, uh, we're starting to see the late summer, early, early fall Apple season volumes start to emerge in states like Washington, New York, Michigan, Pennsylvania, California. Uh, if I look at the reefer volumes out of those five states, they're up about 12% week over week and 20% month over month. We start to see uh, the Midwest markets, uh, especially up in the Michigan Peninsula, come into their own this time of the year. Most of the Midwest apple crop comes from Michigan. 
Uh, outbound reefer loads are up about 17% week over week. Uh, volumes remain really strong out of the West Coast. Uh, the big produce markets, in particular Stockton, uh, San Joaquin Valley, volumes are up 7% week over week. But interestingly, shippers and brokers found plenty of capacity. Rates dropped about $0.03 cents a mile to $2.88 a mile on the outbound side. And about 11% of those loads out of the Stockton market went to Phoenix, Seattle and Spokane. On the flatbed side, the market Spokane. Index- Spokane. Okay. Spokane. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, the flatbed uh, market condition index saw a lot of activity in the southeast last week. Um, obviously, Laura had a big part to do with that, with building and, and lumber material moving into that area. A lot of it was concentrated in Alabama, which is our uh, number one flatbed state. Of note was the Decatur market, where outbound load volumes increased 12% last week. Uh, the other area to look at this week is the upper Midwest market of Cleveland, it's a fairly large market for flatbeds. Uh, volumes jumped 18% week over week, and they're up about 50% for the month. But capacity is also tight, so for flatbed carriers looking for work out of there, rates are up about 2% week over week to $2.57 a mile. That's about $0.47 cents a mile higher than the national flatbed average, which brings us to our year-over-year view of spot rates. We'll start off with dry van. Uh, dry van rates continue to go against seasonal trend. Uh, they're up to $2.11 a mile as of last Sunday. That's about $0.04 cents a mile higher than the highest weekly rate recorded in 2018, which has been our past high watermark for dry van spot rates in the last four years. Obviously, Laura was a factor in that. Uh, we looked at the inbound loads ahead of Laura. The seven-day average for dry van spiked $0.23 cents a mile for loads into the Gulf Coast before Laura hit. Uh, and that was largely due to the emergency agents in storing, uh, staging sorry, a large amount of uh, freight ahead of the hurricane. On to the reefer side, uh, national average reefer rates are now at their highest level in the last five years for the start of September. Rates are up 3% week over week to about $2.28 a mile. That's a $0.06 cents per mile increase for reefer carriers last week. And rates are now $0.43 cents a mile higher than this time last year. On the flatbed side, year-over-year view shows us that uh, rates are uh, trending along where they were in 2017. They ended about $2.10 a mile last week, up $0.05 cents a mile. Uh, rates are about 12% higher year-over-year. Year. They're approaching 2018 levels, uh, considerably higher, though, than 2016. Uh, sorry, 2017, when flatbed capacity tightened uh, after a disastrous hurricane season in September. Uh, rates that started what we saw in 2018 was the, the high rate rally uh, that started largely after the hurricane season in 2017. So, Ned, that's the, the weekly market update on the supply and demand side. What do you have for the forecast? Hey, guys, before we move on, I'm sorry, I, a little bit of a growing pains with our studio. The Internet's a little spotty until we get hardwired. So I apologize for that. Um, I had written down a couple questions, Dean. One was um, I know we just came off uh, DOT break, break check, right? Um, have, did you see any impact related to that? And then part two is the DOT safety blitz was postponed from June until I'm hearing right September. And do you foresee any impact with that? Uh, typically, you see a lot of smaller fleets owner operators take uh, vacation, uh, especially if you follow them on social media. You'll see that they do take the opportunity to avoid those weeks, not because there's anything wrong with their vehicles. It's just because with ELDs, they can't afford the three or four hour delay that it takes for the uh, heavy duty inspections that go on. So it's more a time factor than it is a compliance issue. Uh, typically, when I've tracked telematics data in the past, I see about a 6% drop in truck activity uh, around those particular weeks. So again, anecdotally, we saw a number of trucks take time off during the last uh, break check. This year will be a little bit different because it's more focused on the driver. So I expect a bigger impact this time around, because the focus is on driver compliance and paperwork, which is which is uh, can be much more punitive on, uh, for drivers. Cool. Sorry to jump in. I'll, I'll, I'll get back into the flow and turn it over to Ned, but I appreciate the insight, Dean. All right. So uh, we have our spot rate forecast. Uh, you can see in blue are the historical market rates measured by DAT. Um, or I should say historical spot rates, uh, because some folks have a bet, uh, an idea that market rates are different than spot rates. And well, that's a, that's a topic for another time. Uh, moving off to the right, we can see our various forecast models. Uh, in red is our short-term model. In uh, green is our rate cast model. And then in between, we have our two blended models that are mixtures of the two other models in different proportions and in different ways. So for these models, um, 
we see there's initially a fair bit of convergence for the first week or so, but then the, the differential slopes are really what's taking over, where the short-term model is expecting there to be this continued up and to the right. Uh, the rate cast model is expecting that the kind of little neck or or tilt you can see in the, the forecast is going to continue itself. And the blended forecasts are expecting um, obviously a, a mixture of these two trends. Uh, given everything that I've seen, and obviously if you told me this back in April, I wouldn't have believed you, but uh, it's been up and to the right. So I see no reason why um, there's been any signs of anything um, tilting it more down. So I expect that the short-term model is going to be uh, correct in this case or more correct. Um, and I have a question for you there. Yeah. Um, you know, it seems like just a few months ago we were talking about kind of a, a, a floor, right, for rates. Right. So, you know, um, putting in a, an artificial lower bound. I mean, do you see any, or how often do you think about any upper bound? Like, how high could spot rates go for drive-in? From now, what I've heard, from what I've heard talking to folks. Um, 250 is kind of the the limit at which a lot of the the shippers that don't have the the profit margins to absorb that kind of um price uh are just going to stop shipping freight uh, i don't know whether or not that's true because uh if shippers can pass a along their uh uh cost the increased cost to consumers then you might be able to see that continuing um but honestly like we're we're getting into uncharted waters here um and i'm very curious about how things are going to behave. Uh, what are your thoughts on it, Ken? No, it's interesting. I, mean, I asked because I'm curious to get kind of the technical perspective. I think um, non-technically, yeah, in 2018, right, you started to see a lot of freight get bumped um, days out to, you know, defer, you know, either you couldn't mm -hmm. flat out find capacity or you had to defer to try to get a little bit of a better rate. But um, yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about like what is that upper bound and when do the mechanics of the spot market start to change in a way that will, um, you know, shippers will take action to, to minimize. And of course, we're talking about national rates, right? I mean, it, right. it's over $3 a mile heading into Denver right now. Sure. Um, there are certain lanes that have become one-way rates effectively. We're just looking at the national rates as sort of a wholesale barometer for what's going on. So, uh, so to let you in. Yeah, to, to give like a little bit more technical context, I do have a saturating ceiling and a saturating floor on these forecasts. So it won't go up to infinity uh, and it won't go down to zero. Um, I put the saturating ceiling at about 250 a mile based on, on prior evidence and, and what you've seen. But um, one of the things about modeling is that you have to understand when conditions are different. And to the extent that we see no resistance as we start to close in on 250, I'm going to adjust the, the saturating ceiling um, going forward. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Um, sorry to, sorry yeah. to jump in there. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no worries. I'm, I'm happy. I, I, Unsurprisingly, as somebody who does this show, I love the sound of my own voice and I love to talk about my models. And so I'm happy to, to share some of the, the technical details of what's going on. Um, moving forward to the reefer rates, here you can see that there's a little bit more agreement, um, at least initially. But again, that slope is winning out where the short term model is expecting there to be a continued up and to the right presence, whereas the uh, uh, rate cast model is expecting more of a flat. Uh, what we've seen in reefer is that although it is up and to the right on like a broad scale, there have definitely been some periods of more flatness. Uh, if you can look back at like the, the mid August flat period, and then um, the, the May through June, late June flat period. Uh, I expect that uh, given the, the pattern of those, I expect there to be at least a little bit of flatness going forward, but I expect the, the overall trend is up and to the right. And so I, I think the blended forecasts are probably gonna have a fair bit of, uh, of uh, truthiness to them. Uh, finally, we're moving on to the flatbed forecasts. So again, uh, the blue line is uh, historical rates observed by DAT. And then off to the right, we have our uh, model suite um, with red being the short-term model. Um, gray and yellow being the blended forecast and green being the flagship rate cast model. Here in flatbed, I'm, I'm going to be honest, one of the reasons why I really like having Dean on the show is that he has a lot more insight into the flatbed market than I do because the flatbed market is just so heterogeneous. Um, there's just so much difference between different flatbed rates and the way that a flatbed rate is constructed, like that on a national perspective, it's just an aggregation of like individual markets rather than there being like a world spirit of this is how flatbed is behaving. And um, what I would say here is that um, there are definitely signs of at least some kind of a bump or a dip, but um, I'm, I've had enough hat for this year. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to punt uh, on, on which of these models, but 
you know, if, if you if you really ask me, I, I'd say that the blended forecasts are probably going to be uh, have a, have a fair bit of, of informational content to them. Um, obviously, all the forecasts do, but uh, if you have to pick a strand of spaghetti, which strand are you going to pick? And I'd go for maybe the the, the gray line that blended yeah. forecast be too. You know what's interesting, Ned, and I'm interested to get Dean's take on this too. Is some of the areas that we're seeing shortages, like building supplies, lumber in particular, would impact on the supply side the the flatbed. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, I think it'll be curious to watch and see how that plays out. Uh, it's also kind of a, a shame that a lot of what's required after hurricane to rebuild is in what's short supply right now, right? It's, you know, lumber and building materials. I think, Ken, the other thing to remember is that a lot of building materials for construction uh, in particular goes to destinations one time. So whether it's a rebar for a high-rise construction building or, you know, plywood for, you know, prepping for a hurricane or prefabricated concrete for a bridge span, a lot of those loads go to areas that are, you know, one-off events. So what you see is also a lot of empty miles. That's why flatbed carriers typically run the highest number of empty miles after they get into a market. So there's a, to Ned's point, there's a lot of individual transactions that go from very small shippers who have small fleets that service them on the spot market to destinations that are really one-off events, which is very different to dry van and reefer, where you've got a lot of repetitious, uh, you know, transactions occur on different OD pairings. Right. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch across all three equipment types. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I'm going to transition to our question of the week. And we had what we thought was a really good question, but the more that we batted it around as a team, we realized um, we could probably spend the entire length of the show talking about this. And the question really dealt around what fundamentals, when we say fundamentals, you mean like seasonality or head haul, back haul or retail industrial, which of those are holding true during COVID and which aren't? So we're going to use this as a talking point in our live show on Thursday at three o'clock. Um, and we're going to, you know, again, we're interested to hear from you. Like what fundamentals are you seeing? You know, as we talked about Denver market, LA to Denver, we're seeing um, kind of crazy rating patterns happening there. And I'm sure they're happening all over the country. So um, feel free to ask IQ at DAT.com to send us a question to discuss in the live show. And there'll be other ways to get in touch with us. Uh, we'll have links in the description below. And we'll try to share out the link to the event on our um, individual social pages later today. But for the sake of still having a question to talk about, I just wanted to go around the room real quick and talk about what each of us are watching from kind of an external market perspective that will weigh heavy as we head into the fall freight season. So with that, I wanted to start with Dean and just kind of go around the room, the virtual room. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ken. Great question. Uh, my focus for the next few months is on consumer spending. You know, consumer spending accounts for about two thirds of the US economic activity. Uh, I've been studying the IRI uh, consumer packaging demand index for the last few months. You know, CPG packaging are things that we buy in a supermarket that need constant replenishment. Um, those vol even though the volume, the index for CPG is up 11% year over year, it's been trending down. It's down about 6% since its peak in June. Uh, 21 sort of post the massive stock up that we had during the lockdown. So uh, it's very interesting. IRA tracked the latest data that's available for consumer spending at the point of purchase. So it's it's good to watch because it tells you about how consumers are changing their spending patterns. We're seeing things like edible food volumes, uh, double digit rate increases, anything that consumers can buy that have longer shelf life, uh, where they can stock up and limit the number of trips to the supermarket, those volumes are high. Uh, and a couple of things jumped out this week, you know, things like sales of bacon are up 20% year over year, whereas mm. uh, shaving product sales are down 8% year over year as all of us work from home. <laughs> bacon and beards. That's it. Uh, we're living in what Ron Swanson's America. All right. <laughs> uh, for my take, uh, I'm really interested in uh, following MCI. So one of the reasons why I like MCI so much and, and one of the reasons why I follow it in general is because it does have a, a um, leading effect on rates. And um, that's been historically true, but uh, that's something that I'm really interested in seeing as things are going forward, whether that continues to hold, because there is a fair amount of strange behavior. And to the extent one of the, the big questions about MCI and, and something that I think is really important is its ability to capture both like the temperature, but also the amount of heat. And that heat, uh, rather than just the temperature, I think is going to be 
really kind of put to the test as as markets shift and as things change. And so uh, I'm I'm looking really closely at it. All right. I appreciate the shamelessness as always, Ned, to uh, talk about a DAT product. Um, and for those not familiar, Ned's talking about the DAT Market Conditions Index, which we launched this spring, which is a really great way to compare markets um, relative heat and strength, um, as well as weakness in and out. Um, I'll just wrap it up with a couple of things I'm watching. Um, I think the biggest story that we're not hearing a ton about, but I think it's really a big deal, is some of the rail surcharges we're seeing coming off the West Coast. Um, we all know that there's been this flush of imports, especially in the West Coast ports like LA and Long Beach. A lot of that stuff comes off the coast, inland, uh, via intermodal. And with some of these surcharges, we're essentially seeing the rails say, no, thank you um, to smaller uh, shippers moving freight inland. So that will almost necessarily spill over into the uh, truckload, over the road truckload market. And those markets are already fairly saturated. So um, a lot of these just went in place or were increased yesterday or um, the day before. Um, so we're watching very closely on those areas to see what happens. I think also it goes without saying, um, I think we're all kind of waiting for the government to get its act together a little bit um, as far as stimulus and, um, you know, Dean mentioned consumer spending and my kind of uh, redundant and cheeky line has been, if people have money this fall, they're going to spend it. I think, but to, to, to be able to spend it, they need to have it. And I think we've seen positive results from the first round, round and a half of stimulus. Um, and I think folks are counting on um, another round this fall. So that'll be um, important to watch. But with that, I'm going to wrap it up for the week um, for this pre-recorded show. And again, plug our live show on Thursday at three. There'll be links in the description below. Um, you can catch Dean's long form market update, which is outstanding and chock full of information um, at DAT.com slash market update. And then lastly, if you have any questions not related to what we talked about here or the live show, you're just genuinely curious about what's going on out there or you're seeing something funky that you can't explain, I would suggest not calling Ghostbusters, but rather writing askiq at DAT.com and we will do our best to help you out in a timely fashion. So with that, uh, we hope to see you Thursday and we're signing off for now. Have a good one. Bye all. Bye bye.